and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. As a nation, we've been fascinated by the weather for decades. Rarely a day goes by when we don't discuss it. But these days, our weather is much more than a passing pleasantry, as the world faces up to an unprecedented climate emergency and the urgent need to change our lifestyles to save our planet. My guest this week is meteorologist and author Claire Nazir, whose working life is immersed in climatology and meteorology. She joined the Met Office first time round in the early 90s and has compiled and presented tens of thousands of forecasts on TV and radio. Claire and I met on breakfast television when Claire was our weather forecaster on ITV. She remains a familiar, trusted face in our living rooms and on the airwaves, on Channel 5 and working for the Met Office. Claire, it's so lovely to see you. It's been a while since we've chatted. How are you and how has the lockdown been for you? Good to see you, Helen. In fact, we used to see each other every day, didn't we? I day know. In, day out at an ungodly hour of the morning where you always look incredible, I have to say. <laughs> so um, kind. And I always feel like in makeup, we used to go through a car wash. And what we really wanted to do was talk about news, about politics, economics and meteorology, climate change. But you have to get your face on first, don't you? You have to have that first cup of coffee. I really did feel we were hung on a coat hanger and dressed and our hair was done and our makeup was put on and we saw each other at various stages didn't we of just having climbed out of bed at four o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was and uh, it was a brilliant time there's nothing quite like live telly is there there isn't and you obviously went to New York which was unbelievable for you and at times harrowing and I spent a lot of my time on the road as well talking about extreme weather so yes it's been a long time and it's lovely to see you. Do you look back on those days with fondness Claire? Yes I do I, I still can't cast my mind back to those fond memories. And many people are, I would call them my extended family, people like Kate Garraway, who still works on Breakfast TV. I don't know how she does it, to be honest, but she's godmother to my daughter and many others who I stay in contact with. Because actually, when you work at that time, you have to socialise with those people because no one else will be socialising and going to bed at seven o'clock like we used to. Absolutely. And massive bonds form Penny Smith for our news reading days, still a fantastic friend of mine. I spend a lot of time with her. And I'm sure you've been a great support to Kate with Derek and everything she's gone through. She's been extraordinary, actually. I don't really know how she's done it. She's such a strong, inspirational woman. Yeah, she's been a real warrior. But, you know, we all have our thresholds. We all have our glass ceilings and it's not over for Kate yet. It's autumn 2021. Derek is now out of hospital, but he's still really sick. I was there, stayed there last week and things are only going slowly in the right direction. And it's quite a bumpy road. So my heart goes out to her and the kids and obviously Derek as well. Absolutely. In those days, Claire, and correct me if I'm wrong, because your background is science. I always felt the weather when I switched on the weather forecast. For me, it was about, you know, do I need to take my brolly? Is it going to rain later? And now we're in such a different sphere with climate change. Where are we at? I know that's an enormous question, but where are we with it? That's interesting, actually. Two things I'll say about that. First of all, this autumn, the Nobel Prize for Physics went to two climate scientists. The first time that's ever happened. They, it's been recognised as climatology, as you know, up in that sphere of science. But the work that these two guys did, Manabi and Hasselman, was back in the 60s. And they projected how our climate was going to be if we didn't curb carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. They also created the most amazing tools, which now we're using day in, day out, to analyse the climate change fingerprint on extreme weather events. So that's one thing that really we've come to realise. It's, you know, it's taken a long time. It's five decades of work where these guys have been so patient and now we're all almost there on the same page. Secondly, back in the day when we worked together, I remember going to our amazing and gorgeous editor, Peter McHugh, who sadly has passed now. And he was a visionary in so many different ways. And I said to him, we need to talk about climate change, Peter. And this is back in the early 2000s. So a long time before the Paris Agreement, which was 2016. Kyoto had happened, but even so, there was a lot of delay and a lot of doubt still going on. And I had a, a map of the UK and how it was going to change because of sea level rise. And I said to him, look, this is how it's going to be in 100 years if we don't do anything about climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. And he said to me, and all seriousness, and I almost go forward with laughter, you make that 25 years and you've got yourself a story. Oh, and this is how things have changed. People's perception, 
but also how the science has changed because we're living with climate change now. It's a clear and present danger. And Peter understood unless it was within our lifetime, unless it was within our generation, people weren't going to engage. And this is the problem with where we're going with global warming, is that it's real now and we're almost chasing our tails and our tails are on fire. Whereas we could have done so much more back in the early 2000s to curb CO2, but it wasn't real. There was no reality associated with it. So why would we change our habits? Why would big business change their habits? Why would finance companies understand climate risk? We didn't have the data then, whereas we have the data every day now, whether it's wildfires or flooding, extreme weather and storm damage. It's happening every day. And the work that these two Nobel prize winners for physics were doing back then is being realised every day. The tools that they created back in the 60s, we're now using now and saying that, you know, Hurricane Ida, the amount of rain which fell not only across the southern states of the US, but up towards the northeastern quadrant of the states where there was horrific flooding. People died in their basements because of the amount of biblical rain that fell in that 24 hours. We can now go back with what we call attribution studies and find that climate change or CO2 fingerprint and say, actually, because the amount of carbon dioxide we've pushed into the atmosphere, this event would not have happened. The chemistry, the, the ingredients wouldn't have been there if we had been better and looked after the earth in a, a fairer and cleaner way. What do you think then from that, Claire, was the tipping point? Is the tipping point the fact that now we're experiencing these extreme conditions? And here we are too. I mean, not like Hurricane Ida, but we do have days, don't we, where we have excessive heat or torrential rain like we've never really seen before. Yes. In fact, the heat waves we recently experienced across the UK in the last few years, attribution studies have been applied to those events. And the conclusions are actually the type of heat wave we're getting now is because of climate change seven times to 30 times more likely because of the amount of CO2 we're pumping into the atmosphere. So that's one thing I think. What's changed? Well, we're living in, we're on the front line of climate change and we're talking not just small islands who are really scared about actually losing their land because of sea level, but the fires, the Hades, you can see on the, on the news in California, in Canada, you know, just this summer, they reached 50 degrees Celsius. Unbelievable. Australia was annihilated. The Blue Mountains, a beautiful area of Australia, and millions of animals lost their lives, as well as people's lives and livelihoods. So it's happening right now. And the cost now of doing something is less, should I say, than more in 10 years time when it's going to be even worse. Who's woken up? Well, big business has woken up. Who's woken up? The finance houses are. Insurance companies are paying out more than they ever had. So they need almost a roadmap going forward of where we're going with this and what are the solutions. And the solutions are very simple. They're clear and they've been mapped out for decades now. We have to change our lifestyles. And that all comes down to sustainability, clean living and reducing our CO2 emissions. So working towards net zero. Does it frustrate you that change is still very slow? I feel frustrated as somebody who cares very deeply about the environment without the scientific knowledge that you have. But I do have the realisation that if we all don't act soon, our planet won't be here for us in a few decades to come. I get frustrated with things like going into supermarkets and still seeing bananas and avocados and things that don't need to be wrapped in plastic, wrapped in plastic. Why do we just not ban that? I think one key thing I've seen recently is the consumer demand is driving down costs on new innovation. So I'll give you an example. Back in 2013, there was a hamburger, a beef burger created by stem cells and 3D printing, which is unbelievable. And it costs something like, and I'm going to throw a figure out there, but I'm sure it was more than that. To develop the prototype, it was about 100,000 US dollars, something like that. Now, people were saying, well, that's pie in the sky and that's never going to get onto our shelves. But actually, in seven, eight years, the industry has gone from that to now being able to create the same burger at a cost of around 10 to $20 because 
the innovation is there, the technology is there, the computing capacity is there, and the desire for people to eat what we call meatless meats is absolutely going through the roof. So when people demand something, then technology responds, scientists and innovators respond. And then along comes the business person and says, oh, we'll have some of that because obviously it's going to make us money. So with the alt protein market, it's going through the roof right now. And if you read numerous reports about where it's projected to be, say, in the next 10 or even 20 years, the amount of land that we'll be using just to farm cows, which have an incredible environmental footprint just purely by what they eat, the amount of land they eat they use and then where they're shipped around the world for us to eat and the waste then that we we see because of that. These reports are suggesting 60% of that land is going to be left dormant because the cow almost will be not redundant, but certainly put in a corner there. So these reports are using analysis and real-time data to project only five or 10 years into the future. And when that sort of data is used by or seen by people who want to make money out of the next best thing or the next new thing, then they're all latching onto it. So investors are now putting a lot of money, huge amounts of money into these companies. And the results will be realised in the next few years. And it's not just meatless meat. We're talking about EV here, electric vehicles. Even the UK government has pledged that no, there's going to be a rollout of EV to a point that we're going to stop making cars which use petrol and diesel in the next 5 to 10, 15 years. is absolutely unbelievable and something I don't think we could have reported on with any credibility even 10, 15 years ago. Give us a flavour, Claire, when you're in the Met office. Actually, I've read that in the previous article you call it your happy place and I can understand completely why. What kind of climatic forecasting is going on there? How far ahead are you looking? And can you give us a flavour of what it feels like there working with the people at the top of their field like you? I work with the most amazing creative minds. They are, and they're so dedicated to their job as well. So the Met Office is probably ranked the best in the world with perhaps the Japanese Met Service for innovation, for research, and for even their computing power. And there's two sides to the Met Office. There's the operational side where all the forecasters are and they're forecasting the weather every day and using the most state-of-the-art techniques to do that, not only in the UK, but around the world. They do global forecasting as well. And there's another part of that organisation which I'm very much involved in is the Hadley Centre. And there's over 100 climate scientists there who contribute and research to create research, not only for their own fields, but also for the International Panel on Climate Change and other institutions around the world. And what these two bodies really need and require every day is huge computing power and capacity, because we're talking big data here and we're going into the, the world of deep learning. The amount of information that we need to utilise to understand not only what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day, but what's going to happen in the next year, 10 years, 100 years, 300 years when you come to sea level rise, because sea level rise is such a slow burn, but it's going to carry on even if we curb CO2 emissions. That sort of data is fundamental to their work. And even in the last few years, things have changed. There's been a step change. There's been a real acceleration in what they can do. So I'll give you an example. With climate computer models, not only do we have to understand tipping points, and you spoke about tipping points earlier, tipping points in terms of Amazonia, will it go from a carbon sink where it's absorbing carbon dioxide to a carbon source where it's emitting and some parts of Amazonia are now doing that to massive ocean currents which really dictate our weather to the jet stream and how it's going to change because of climate change and sea ice, Arctic sea ice, the amount of melt happening every year. They're large scale processes but what we haven't been able to understand or really define in a really good and a a high level way, the local processes which also contribute to climate change impacts. For example, in the UK, what we see, particularly in the summer, things like storms. Now, if you cast your mind back to the summer this year, 2021 in London, roads became rivers as we saw a massive storm come up from the south. And this 
caused so much damage across London. It really did. There was so much flooding, incredible amount of disruption. I can't imagine what the insurance bill would have been. And also people still living out those nightmares because if your house is flooded, it takes six months minimum to get back to a point where you can live in it again. So the climate change models are now refining their ability to be able to understand what's happening, not at a grid space of 10 kilometres or 50 kilometres or 100 kilometres, which is what we use for forests and for oceans, but at one to five kilometres, a much, much more fine scale. So we can now model what's happening in London or in Hull, Manchester, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Belfast, and understand what the impacts are likely to be with another step in warming. So for us, one of the key things we are seeing through the summer is that the summers are getting hotter. We are seeing more heat waves, but also we're seeing more rain. But this rain is localised. This rain is torrential rain, which is damaging rain, which is violent storms, which impacts people on a local level. But there's 10 million people in, in London. You get a storm coming up like that, and it's massively disruptive to a huge swathe of the population of the UK. So this is really important studies that we're doing here at the Met Office and work which now not only we can analyse and we can gain results from, the other step change I've seen in climate change is the language that these scientists are now using in their reports so it's accessible to everybody. So we actually understand the numbers plain and simple and we can act on them So the information can be used for insurance purposes, for banking, for businesses about where they're going to locate their buildings, for the infrastructure of cities, how we're going to plan our next set of roads or green spaces or cycle lanes. So we can cope with climate change, but also we can adapt to it and mitigate it as well. So, you know, the new design of buildings is very, very different to what the houses that that exist in London right now. I mean, I moved from London 10 years ago and I was living in a Georgian house and prone to flooding, prone to damp, prone to everything because climate change wasn't happening back in 120 years ago, but it is now. This week I was hosting a rail conference about decarbonisation in the rail industry and climate change was one of our debates and talking to experts about how the railway has to change because we used to joke in the old days, didn't we, about leaves on the line and things like that. And of course now flooding and excessive heat and all the extreme weather that you've mentioned has a massive impact on our safety and transport and railways. So it was interesting to see what they were doing. One thing I'm always curious about, Claire, and I'm sort of slightly embarrassed to admit, I don't really know the answer. We talk about climate change. I feel passionately about doing my bit and getting people involved where I can and working in the sustainability side of what I do. But I don't really understand the numbers and how a change in the temperature causes the extreme weather. Why would you know about this? Because it's almost like We all use washing machines, but when my washing machine goes wrong, I I don't know the first thing about why it's gone wrong. It's just making a squeaky noise. And the science behind climate change has been there for years. But the practicalities of that, uh, what you understand, and that's where you're so good in the role that you do. However, in a nutshell, I'll give you an example. The temperature, the global temperature of the world, so the global temperature has risen by about 1.1, 1.2 degrees since pre-industrial levels. So we're going back now to the 1800s, when in the Industrial Revolution, we started using fossil fuel like we've never used before, particularly coal at the time, and we were churning it out. And in fact, it improved our lives you know, immeasurably on, on every level. It started in Europe, it moved then to other, what we call developed countries. And then obviously the big players such as India and China, the emerging markets sort of came into their own and used the technology to a scale we've ever, never, ever seen before. So we're all pumping out greenhouse gases and that's burning fossil fuels, that's oil, gas and coal. So that's one thing. And the level of carbon dioxide, which has been pumped into the air, has gone up from about, and we measure this in parts per million, about 280, and that's pre-industrial levels, to now it's around 415 parts per million. So it doesn't sound very much, does it? It's, you know, it's jumped over, it's doubled basically, pretty much, it's almost since the 1800s. That's one thing. And can I just say that level is different depending on where you live in the world. That's almost like a global level. And we know 
that it is that number because there's a gold standard of measuring that happens in Hawaii called the Mauna Loa Mountain. And they've been studying this carbon dioxide emissions for, for five decades now. And, you know, you can see that even the deviation through a year when forests come into their own and they absorb more carbon dioxide because their leaves grow. And then when it spikes during autumn and winter, because obviously there's less foliage to absorb the gases. That's one thing. The second thing, you think 1.12 degrees is not much. The last time we had a ice age here across the Northern Hemisphere was uh, many, many millennia. Uh, but the temperature was only five degrees lower. We're not talking about the temperature here in Manchester this morning is probably eight degrees. It's going to probably go up to 13. That's a nice hike. That's a hike of five degrees. We're talking hundreds of years, thousands of years of change. So the energy in one degree of heat across the globe is gargantuan. If we dropped by five degrees globally over the next two, three years, 10 years, we'd go into probably another ice age, mini ice age, definitely. So if you think about it in the other terms, going from a step of one degree, two degrees, imagine how, this is why Greta talks about your house being on fire. The heating that's happening across the world is playing out in natural processes are responding in all the ways that they should respond because it's too hot. So that's why we talk about it in those terms. When we talk about carbon dioxide, the reason why we focus on carbon dioxide is not only it's a, it's a greenhouse gas. So um, when it absorbs heat, it becomes a more active as molecules or as a gas in the atmosphere and then emits heat. It acts as a blanket, keeping the heat trapped within the lower layers of the atmosphere. That's one thing. The other thing is when you produce carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere, it lasts for a heck of a long time. It lasts for hundreds of years. So that's why we have to do something about it now, because it's going to take a long time for that carbon dioxide, the life of carbon dioxide, to actually slowly wane. Methane is a more potent greenhouse gas. It emits much more heat when it absorbs infrared energy, but it doesn't last as long. So one of the solutions that many climate scientists are suggesting is like we need to deal with the methane issue around the world because methane's going up and it's produced in lots of different ways, including the way it's emitted in, in just rubbish, in just food, cows. But the other issue we have, and, and you, you know, we touched on tipping points, there are many tipping points around the world. And that's um, when we talk about climate tipping points, we're talking about abrupt and irreversible change to the system which we're looking at. So I'll give you an example. When the sea ice melts and melts completely, we, we're in a very different world there. And permafrost is another one which is a big issue, something which we're massively concerned about, particularly around the Arctic Circle. And we've seen unprecedented fires in the summer because of the heat that's really been transmitted and affected this part of the world. When permafrost thaws... When the ice, which is embedded within the ground, slowly melts, it releases methane as well as other gases. So that's something we really, really are concerned about because that's hikes in air temperature, which plays into the global temperature. The other thing I must talk about here also is the global temperature is 1.12 degrees of heating we've seen since pre-industrial times. That's not a uniform temperature. Africa is heating faster. And the Arctic is heating faster, at least twice as fast. So there are parts of the world which are really seeing the impacts of climate change much quicker than we are, say, in the UK. Does it break your heart, Claire, when you see, you know, the ice caps melting and the devastating effect that climate change is already having on indigenous people and cultures and remote parts of our planet? And when you talk about remote parts of the planet, these are the people who've been living with nature for all their lives for all their generations. And they're the ones who are, are suffering the most, I would say. So that's one thing. I do take it very personally when people are ignorant about climate change. One really important measure I think that has happened recently is 10 years ago, climate deniers had so much airtime on television and radio because of impartial reporting. And it, it wasn't impartial because A, they got their facts wrong, their arguments were flawed, but this is 0.001% of the people who have got really loud and very annoying voices. COP26, where 197 countries are coming together 
to discuss the climate crisis. There's consensus that the science is right. The language is strong. The language has never been stronger and more confident because we understand and we've seen the results and people are coming together to try and create solutions. And the people who have the greatest voices should be those who've been living on the land and have seen the land change immeasurably through their lifetimes. And this is livelihoods here. We're talking about their food, about where they live. I mean, I live in a brick house and even on the worst storms, I might have some wind damage, but I can still step out the next day and feel okay. It's not the case for millions of people around the world, particularly rural communities. And there's more rural communities populating earth than people like ourselves. It's interesting you mentioned the ice caps and things like that because we've interviewed the UN patron of the oceans and Arctic swimmer, extreme Arctic swimmer, Lewis Pugh, who I'm sure you're aware of what he's been doing. But he was saying on the podcast that he's around the age of 50 now and he's just finished another Arctic challenge where he swims in a pair of Speedos, with no grease on his body. And the reason he does it in such an extreme fashion is he knows that will generate the front page photograph to spread the word. And he's said to me, Helen, I'm nearly 50. This could kill me one day doing this. And I never thought 30 years on, I'd still be doing it. And the change in the images that you see from when he first started raising awareness of what was going on in the Arctic and the Antarctic, it's absolutely shocking. And that part of the world is a real indicator, isn't it, Claire, for what's going on? Certainly. It really is a real beacon of response to climate change. And that's the key thing that we're looking for here. And and the evidence is obviously everywhere. But these campaigners who have been campaigning for decades, I mean, I don't know how they get up in the morning sometimes because they are battling against multinationals, against governments who, you know, even though they may be saying the right thing, uh, you know, there are net zero pledges all around the world right now. When is that going to be manifested in in action? And I work for a government organisation. I work for the Met Office. I have to be careful what I say here. But I do think that there are a lot of people within these organisations who are really working hard and doing their damnedest to make change. And I think that's the key thing. It's almost like the critical mass. It's the roads converging on a point where Everyone comes together and that's the, you know, the people who get it most, who understand it most, the Gen Z. Their voice is united, their determination unrelenting and it has to be. And they are an absolute credit to where they've come from because they're living it every day and they don't talk about the good old days because, you know, they're not old enough. So we can talk about the summers when we had proper winters and snow and lovely dry summers. You know, everything is all a mishmash now. So it's the coming together of different parts of society. So that is Gen Z. That's us who really, really have seen the changes over so many decades. It's business. It's the big hitters. It's those Bill Gates and Mark Carneys who have an absolute responsibility for doing and saying and bringing together the right organisations to do the right thing. And it's governments, it's policymakers and also the scientists. The scientists have a responsibility themselves to be able to communicate the information in such a way that it's practical. We've all got blood on our hands because we've all been burning CO2 like it's going out of fashion for too long. But also we do have a joint responsibility to push forward. And that's why the COPs, which happen every year, it's not just COP26, there'll be a COP27, a COP28. There was a COP1. Every year we're just pushing forward to the next level. There needs to be pressure and there needs to be pressure from every part of society to make it happen. And we're addicted to fossil fuel. We're addicted to to energy. And that's why the innovators need to be up there talking to the policymakers, talking to the big investors. It is about investment. It is about big business. It is about big finance to create the solutions that are necessary just going to ask how optimistic you feel about COP26 and you know what will come out of this in Glasgow in the next few weeks. The key thing is, is that it's being scrutinised by everybody. Not since I would say at Paris has there been such a lens on such an event. And that's really important. There's nowhere to hide with these negotiations. It's going to be reported through the channels, the tentacles go out to every ear in the world. Everyone living on this planet is going to be listening to the results of the discussions of what's going to happen, what's going to unfold over two weeks. Some good things, Biden is there rather than Trump. 
and there's big players around the world, which where there is a lot of unknowns, Australia, China, Russia, Brazil, who are all big emitters and have a lot to lose short term from changing their habits and their ways and their policies. So it's going to be a very interesting event. From my point of view as a climate communicator, I've never seen such an amazing array of information which is digestible, which is palatable, more so than ever. Now, everybody can have a look at this data, understand the conclusions, the projections, the future trends in climate and also impacts and work backwards from there. So the information's there, it's out there for everyone to understand. So I think there's a better opportunity now than ever before to come out with some really good solutions. And I'm saying this is that the climate science and the policymaking has built on the work of thousands of others through decades. You know, this is not just a new thing. If we go back to Kyoto, Rio, work was being done then, but we know much more now and we're living through much more now. So there has been a slow progression and it has at times faltered. There's been a lot of doubt, but there's a huge amount of determination now. So I do have a positive feeling about COP26 that we are going to get some results. Where did your passion for all this come from and how did you end up studying, I think it was, I'm going to get this wrong, oceanology. Is that right? Ocean- no, oceanography <laughs> and maths at university. Yeah. I went to a state school. It was a pretty basic state school at the time. It's now changed its name and its uniform for various reasons. So I didn't have the greatest platform for education. My daughter's in a much better place than I think I was with the amount of good teaching. I had good teachers, but I think times now are are different depending on what school you're in. But I was really determined to do well. I loved looking at nature, natural processes. I I teach kids now, actually, I teach youngsters about weather. Do you? And yeah, and the only thing I need to do is just step outside with a bunch of five, six, seven-year-olds and look up in the sky and go, right, what's happening here? And, you know, it's amazing, it's science in action and the empowerment you get just from explaining how a cloud forms. It stays with them and it's, you know, that's a seed. It's a seed of incredible knowledge, which... And that's how it started for me, really, that can grow into an oak tree, really. And so mathematics is my first love. And I studied mathematics, but I always wanted to study meteorology. It's fluid dynamics, it's called in the world of science. So I went from mathematics to a master's in oceanography, but it was the mathematics of oceans. And in particular, I was very interested in, at the time, how pollution flowed from rivers down into the estuary and out into the ocean. So I sort of base a lot of my study on that. And then I did a, a postgrad in meteorology. And was very lucky enough to gain a place at the Met Office. There was 800 people going for my job. Wow. Two people got it that year. So I was very, very lucky. I had a lot of support, though, from my university, University of Plymouth, who managed to get me a a scholarship for my master's, a NERC scholarship, which was just incredible. And I would have gone on. I think I was offered a PhD, actually, at Hull University. Were you? My Um, part of the world. Yeah. But I just needed to get in my hands dirty, really, and get into my career. And the Met Office training was absolutely incredible. And, you know, I'm not talking hit TV and radio here. I'm talking proper hardcore science. So you, the, the stuff that you do and you, you learn the training and the academic level you have to reach to qualify. So in those days, it was three years of training. And so you had on the job training, but also you had five months of just being in a lecture theatre, just learning from the best people. And then you go on to do advanced forecasting training and, you know, you're always learning. And that's the thing about weather. It's, you know, you're always going to be a student of meteorology. And that's how I started my career. And every day I step through the doors of the Met Office. The Met Office is now based in Exeter. And it's an incredible building. It's state of the art. It's, oh God, you know, you feel like you've just hit a film set. It's so beautifully designed. And there's been so much vision in biodiversity around it. It has no heating or air conditioning. The heat is pumped out from the supercomputer, which sits close by. But in the summer, there's a stream that runs through the main sort of street of the Met Office and the windows and the, the, even the curvature of the building is utterly breathtaking. So every day you step into a, an environment like that, you are inspired. And then you're just mixing with the biggest brains in Britain, if not the world, when it comes to climate science and meteorology. 
So it's a no-brainer for me, really. And I am a small brain amongst really big fish there. And it is an absolute honour and I feel very humble to be working in that environment. And when you went down this path as a youngster and you were so motivated at school, your school sounds very similar to mine. I like the way you described it actually as a basic comprehensive. That's probably how I'd describe mine. What about mum and dad? Did they inspire you and support your vision and dreams at that young age? Oh, absolutely. Both of them incredible and everything is possible. They're amazing. And my family are amazing. I've got three brothers. I've got an amazing sort of very 21st century family. Lots of, you know, nieces and nephews. And my dad's Pakistani. My mum's from London. And everything was open to negotiation. And you can do this, Claire. It was it was incredible. So coming from a humble background, but a very a family full of love. I am where I am today because of my family. Gosh, that's so lovely to hear. Indulge me a little bit, Claire, as we end. Working in live television, being on location, I know there are some times when the weather is mischievous with you and you've had some pretty exciting broadcasts over the years, which I think as viewers, we all probably have loved. Um, Take me back to Bridlington. Oh, Bridlington. Well, that's just north of your neck of the woods, isn't it? It is. A lovely part of the world, yes. I love that coastline along there. And the backdrop when you're presenting the weather as the sun's rising at 6am is absolutely stunning. And it's a really nice moment for viewers as well when you go, hi, good morning. Okay, you're just getting ready for work. You're just getting ready for school. Take a moment and look at this and you know and you pan round and it's an amazing sunrise and the beautiful beaches or the bays of that area the the coves and you know you think actually I'm blessed to live on such a beautiful island however there was one particular morning in Bridlington I believe it was mid July a few days before my mum got married actually and there was a storm brewing and I'd been on the south coast the day before and and I'd been presenting there and saying there's a storm coming and it is going to whip and lash the UK. And it's unusual for this time of year. It's July. I think it was, I would say 20, I'm going to say 2003. My editor, your editor at the time, Martin Brazil, who loved sending us out in all weathers, head to the East Coast where it's worse, where it's worse. And I said, well, it'd be nice if there, I mean, I love that coastline. Let's just go up there because even on the worst weather, you get a lovely backdrop and nice scene. So we're all there, the crew, the lovely crew who are out in all weathers with me. And we're broadcasting from close to the seawall. And I would say it was 7.30. So peak viewing at the time, I would say it was probably three, four, five million people watching GMTV. No pressure there then, Claire. No pressure there. (laughs) And um, the waves were crashing against the seawall. They really were. The rain was lashing. The wind was whipping up a storm. And as I was going into full, it's going to happen. This is what's happening in in your neck of the woods. A 10 foot wave crashed over the seawall and totally engulfed me and the crew. And we all were down on the floor because the action, the power of the water. And the only thing that stood standing was the camera. (laughs) For the viewer, it went from me going, and there's going to be showers in, to absolutely this wave crashing down and then just the camera still shooting. The sound went... And there was no one there. There was just no one there. I was on the floor. And looking back, obviously it was, we shouldn't have been near the seawall. It was a very dangerous place to be. In fact, even uh, two weeks later, there was another storm and and people got taken into the sea. And, you know, the chances of surviving that are very slim. And I remember I had my, in my ear, I could hear Kate Garraway going, oh my God, is she okay? Is she okay? And I managed to get up and just grab the mic. And it was a really big mic because obviously the wind was so strong. You need a big one rather than a little one. And grab on and just said, I'm I'm okay. I'm fine. The crew are fine. And then obviously here's your summary as in just get take, you know, this is the end. Go ahead to the slide which says what's going to happen today. And literally just collapse on, on in a heap on the floor. And then what happened afterwards, which no one really saw because obviously we were off air. All these amazing people came out of their houses from Bridlington, sort of along the promenade. Particularly, there was a set of B&B women who brought me bacon sandwich, a cup of tea and a blanket. And it was just like, God, people are lovely. People are absolutely lovely. They'd seen what happened. It was 
scary. It really was. And we were all shaking. All of us were. And it was an absolute testament that we should have not been there. And the next day, Martin Frizzell, our editor, who's now editor, award-winning editor of This Morning, sent me to uh, somewhere else in the country to talk to lifeguards about why it was such a stupid place to broadcast from and why it was irresponsible and we should have been well away from that scene rather than getting the big and best story of the day. So I learned a lot of lessons through that. You do a lot for your story, but I think I stepped too far that time. Yeah, it's funny though. Well, there's forecasts you've done and that obviously will be a very memorable one for viewers. Just before we wrap, Claire, I've realised that I haven't talked about what does rain smell like and the children's books that you write and your podcast, Mostly Climate, and your charity work. Um, Just sum up for us what you're up to on that front before we say goodbye. Okay, so I've written... A number of weather books for kids, five, six, seven-year-olds, key stage one early learning, called the Cloud Academy books. There's four out already from Colin the Cloud, Steve the Stratus, the Showbiz Clouds, and Two Clouds on a Cough, which is about air pollution. It's all about different weathers, clouds coming alive, and it's made magical by beautiful illustrations. I do have another one which I'm developing at the moment about the monsoon, actually, and I'm working with the United Nations on that. I work for an agency called IFAD, which is the International Fund for Agricultural Development, representing millions of rural communities around the world. So I'm hoping to go to Nepal next year on a visit to discuss how we can, as the United Nations, support work going on there particularly with their battle, climate change. And there's a book um, which we're working on at the moment for kids about monsoons. So that's the kids' books. And then I've got a, I call it an adult book, but I think that's the wrong phrase, really. Um, a book <laughs> for Sounds interesting, an adult book, yes, <laughs> for grown-ups. Yeah, exactly, um, <laughs> called What Does Rain Smell Like? And I co-wrote that with the amazing Simon King, who's a incredible meteorologist, was a meteorologist in defence. So he was out in Afghanistan and Kuwait and places like that and now works for BBC Radio 5 Live. So we co-wrote a book together, which has gone all around the world, actually. It's been a bestseller, which is fantastic. And I'm currently developing a book about climate change with the most amazing illustrator called Tony Husband, who is a cartoonist and has been a cartoonist for decades with many of the big papers and magazines like Private Eye. So we are working together on 101 Climate Change Facts, I think is a good way of putting That's the working title. It's going to be much more fun than that because I think that illustrations speak a thousand words. So my words will be less than the 80,000 words I wrote for, which is a deep dive into whether, um, what does rain smell like? And this is going to be a lighter, but as informative version. I'm also patron of an amazing charity called Word Forest, and they're an organisation who plant trees and build schools in Kenya. And quite close, my dad was born in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. So it's a, a region of the world close to my heart. He lived there for many years. So yes, I do a lot of work with them there at COP26 as well. And they've got an amazing campaign going on at the moment where they are pressurising the government to create a fortnightly climate change report like we've done for COVID. So where are we at with climate change? What are the impacts? What are we seeing around the UK and around the world? And what are we doing about it? What are our emissions right now? Where are we at with electric vehicles, eating plant-based meat, plastic, all those things, air pollution? So we're campaigning for a weekly or fortnightly brief from the government on climate change. You are a really inspirational woman, as well as a lovely friend, Claire. And it's been a joy to talk to you. I hope when you're in my part of the world, we'll meet up and have a proper catch up. Thank you so much for guesting on The Convex Conversation. It's been really lovely to talk to you today. And I'm sure our listeners are going to really get a lot out of what you've talked about. Helen, it's been an absolute pleasure and lovely to see your beautiful face. (laughs) You've been listening to Claire Nazir, meteorologist and author, Channel 5 presenter, and also Claire's working again at the Met Office. She also does a podcast. She co-produces a podcast called Mostly Climate, which we didn't actually talk about, but do check it out. And she co-produces that for the Met Office. Her books are also well worth a read and would make lovely Christmas gifts, particularly if you've got little people in the family and you want to get them inspired. 
There are more than 70 Convex Conversations available to download and enjoy. Find them all on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'll be back next week with another great guest, so bye for now.